There we go. So, let's see if that does it. Should be coming on. There we go. All right. So, we have a live feed. Do you uh, do you see that, Phil? Are you there? Are you there? Come in. I can see you. Right. Uh, where is it? Oh, there we go. Got live it. now. Perfect. All right. So I think we are good to go. Um, I am going to. We're. Let me, let me pull one thing here. I can see you. Uh, I just muted the YouTube time so we don't get two of us. <laughs> All right, you there, Phil? All right, so are we good to go? Uh, we are here. All right. Let's see if the see if it sounds good over here. Okay, so let's start up here. Okay. Okay. I think how's that volume sounding to you? It sounds a little. Uh, on the Skype? Sounds yeah. fine. Sounds yeah, good. good. Yep. Very All good. Right. All right. I turned the YouTube one down because I was getting double. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep. All right. Hang on. Let me do one more thing here. Okay. So let's start off here. We got, uh, it's just six o'clock. Or, well, I guess six o'clock Pacific time. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Let's uh, so let's jump in here, and we're just gonna start the uh, I'm gonna start this um, the live here, the the keynote. Okay. Uh, hang on, one more sec. Let me adjust the setting here. I am floating around in cyberspace. Yeah, that's that's my company. It's really just the parent company of Phil Rowley Fly Fishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, flycraftangling dot com. Um, YouTube, of course. I've got my own YouTube channel, like you do, and uh, all those social media stuff: Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.
Sure. Yeah. Yeah, earlier this year, uh, Brian, good friend Brian Chan and I released um, our Stillwater Fly Fishing app, kind of a unique uh, learning tool um, that we have out there. It's uh, a free download for both uh, Android and uh, Apple uh, users. Um, there are five chapters uh, contained within the app currently, uh, including in no particular entomology, Stillwater Fly Patterns, Leaders and Knots, Equipment, and entomology. I think I said that. Or no, techniques and tactics. I think I said entomology already. So we've got. Uh, we started with about 70, 75 tips. Uh, all video tips is now over a hundred. Um, uh, some of the content is um, subscription based. We can purchase monthly, quarterly, or annual passes. Um, what really makes this app unique is once you've downloaded the content. Um, the video tips, you can download them to your smartphone through a secure Wi-Fi, and then when you're out on the water and you're faced with a complexing problem that uh, our app may have a solution for you, you can access that app uh, on the water without Wi-Fi. Other platforms such as YouTube, um, you can't do that. You need Wi-Fi to make those work. So really handy that way, and we continue to add uh, new uh, content on a, usually on a monthly basis around three to five video tips every month and we've got well over 200 tips we've still got yet to add to this so there's short little three minute three to five minute tips uh, again on a variety of subjects contained in that chapter so Brian and I are having a lot of fun with that um, keeping it fed keeping the content going uh, feedback from those that have got it has been uh, really great and we really appreciate those people that uh, have downloaded again it's just another learning tool out there that Ryan and I both love teaching and uh, introducing people to uh, still water fly fishing in particular so we just hope that this uh, app provides that uh, tool for it as well you can also get weather reports on there too I just remembered so lots of good stuff nice well let's jump into the first video okay. we're going to start with the uh with the chromie? The chromie, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, when I first started playing around with it, it was a unique coronamid. The coronamid, it's a pattern that imitates coronamid pupa. And uh, at the time, most of the patterns we were using were traditional somber uh, colored patterns because most of our uh, designs were based on the you know if we uh, cleaned a fish for example way back when you'd see you know the pupa the dark coloration but the reality is coronamid pupa like a number of other insects such as calabatus nymphs caddis pupa gary lafontaine talked about this in his classic book caddis flies trap gases uh, beneath their pupil skin or nymphal skin in the case of uh, mayflies, and that helps them elevate their way up towards the surface. So the chromie is all about uh, using a really bright reflective material, in this case, um, flashaboo, silver flashaboo, uh, to imitate those trap gases, because when those pupa become fully inflated and start to uh, make their way up to the surface, they're gonna elevate their way up and they become shinier and shinier, and that's a real trigger for the trout. So that's what this fly is designed to in imitate those inflated pupa that are quite shiny with the uh, gas they use to elevate their way up to the surface. Well, uh, when I first started tying it, it was a wire, bo uh, wire rib, um, but since the uh, um, uh, introduction of uh, the holographic mylars, um, that sort of replaced that. You see, I tie it on a curved scud hook to imitate the comma-like posture that's so common to uh, coronamid pupa. Um, I believe this pattern's originally using a mustad hook. I'm now using a Daiichi 1120. is uh, probably my favorite uh, coronamid scud hook right now. And uh, this, this tying style I use on a lot of my coronamid patterns in that I begin with uh, attaching a set of gills um, I always joke, I, I seem to be the killer of gill material, because every time I find a good gill material, it gets discontinued on me. <laughs> so, um, 
but in this instance, I'm using the uni floss, uh, sorry, uni stretch. Uh, uni floss is also a good material. I'm using that more and more now because it's, um, it's got fluorescent qualities. If you hit it with the uh, UV light, it'll really radiate and pop. And when you fish in this pattern down deep, those gills are going to, they're going to gather that light and reflect it back out. And, and again, this, it's all about standing out in the crowd, you know, this might be hanging down amongst, you know, if, uh, uh, typically oh, there's a number of ways to fish chronomids. I think most people associate chronomid fishing with a strike indicator and a floating line. And that's certainly a very uh, common and effective way to use it. But uh, arguably my favorite way is to fish this called the, the naked technique. And that's how I first learned to fish chronomids. And that was using a floating line and a long leader uh, 15, 18, 20, 25 feet sometimes, depending on the depth. Your leader length is governed um, by the depth of water you're trying to target. And we add 25% to that depth um, because the leader we use is typically a, I use a Rio floor, uh, PowerFlex leader, 15 footer, and simply add tippet uh, to the end of that to achieve my overall um, uh, leader length. So I just cast that out and then use my watch to let it sink, usually a minimum of three sec 30 seconds. And then I just creep it back, just pinch it back so slowly that uh, you can't even make a wake with the fly line. And uh, you'll either feel a tightening of the line, much like a wet fly swing, uh, <laughs> to uh, coin a phrase, or you'll actually see, uh, you know, in calm conditions, you'll see your fly line uh, move, it'll either veer right or left, or the tip of it'll pull down, or a little squiggle towards the end of it will just straighten. You won't even see the take, and that's when you know you're really in the zone. But you can also fish this fast sinking lines vertically, a method we call dangling that we cover w within the app, and uh, midge tip lines. If it's really windy, um, where casting long leaders or uh, indicator systems can become challenging. Um, you can use a slow sinking line, such as a hover line and a shorter leader, and that'll, you know, you're going to let that one sink. If you're using a team of flies, you could be up to two minutes, you know, 15 feet of water or so, and then just bring that back very, very slowly. And the takes on that hover line are, are quite confident um, because of the shorter leader length and, and the sort of in-touch um, connect core lines those have, they're really sensitive. The rib is a uh, holographic mylar, uh, red, um, size small most often. I, my favorite sizes to tie this are probably 10 through 16. Uh, I have tied them as big as a number six uh, for some of those uh, lakes in the Pacific Northwest that are home to some huge Coronamipupus species. You know, we were, I was out there this uh, August with my family and we were fishing eight 2X and 3X long uh, chronomid pupa patterns at times, bomber, bombers we call those. So it started with the red holographic mylar, but uh, now the the combinations are, are endless. I use uh, purple mylar and blues for deep water because those colors stand out. Blacks, browns, greens, olives. There's a host of different um, mylar colors you can use red nowadays. But your standard chromi is a silver flashaboo body with the holographic uh, mylar rib. And at the base of the fly, I always put two or three turns or so of uh, the holographic mylar to form a little red butt because you'll often get residual hemoglobin that gathers at the tip of the abdomen mm -hmm. and then just carry that on forward, um, spacing it. Uh, the target is trying to get seven ribs. It'll give you nine body segments, but I wouldn't get too, too concerned um, with that, I, I don't think fish can count, thankfully. Or if they can see that detail, I again, please explain why they can't see that big pointy hook <laughs> as well. So, a little, little peacock. I don't think you can hurt a fly by putting peacock in it. You know, you could certainly, you know, common practice nowadays is to uh, build up a little thread uh, ramp, a uh, thorax, if you will, either with the uh, black tying thread I'm using here or a lot of tires nowadays, and I do it too on other patterns, is sub, you know, whip fitting a black thread at this point, or in this, where you could tie it with this with the rusty brown thread, and that rusty brown coloration helps imitate the uh, reddish brown coloration of the natural wing pads of a ground. 
Okay. And then it's just a little uh, four. Really, with the thorax, you, you don't want to extend that thorax back any more than about half the bead length. Four to five wraps, basically, to cover up your thread work. And then what I do is I put a little coating of super brushable super glue on that um, uh, thread, so I can uh, uh, carry that right into the base of the peacock curl and really secure it without matting any of those nice iridescent fibers down. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, do you want to talk any more about this one, or do you want to move on to the next fly? Well, the only thing to do is uh, just you trim the gills half the about equal to the length of the bead, and it's really important with flashaboos and crystal flashes and any of these other synthetic materials. They're not known for their durability, so you always want to make sure you give that fly a good body coating, either with the brushable super glue. Oh yeah. Or some of the uh, great UV resins that are out there nowadays. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, sweet. She's done. Sweet. All right, let's uh keep them skinny. <laughs> let's move on to the uh balance leech. Oh yeah. Yeah, balance flies have had a definite effect on my tying. <laughs> huh. Love them. Love them. Nice. Yeah, this is going to be we uh well, now where is this? This little video here. Is this uh what are you catching there? Oh, we're into uh, it. Uh, well, hang sure. hang on a sec. Let's just go into the uh the balance leech bruise. Sure. So yeah. maybe you can talk a little bit about the background with this one. Sure. Um, well, that's the lakes in the Parklands region of Manitoba. I'll be heading there bright and early tomorrow morning, just trying to get ahead of some early season snowfall that's coming. Um, the balance leech, the balance fly concept is originally uh, Jerry McBride out of Spokane, Washington, introduced me to this stuff, and it just makes so much sense. Jerry, you know, started thinking about it, that most flies, when you hang them under an indicator, hang vertically. And with the exception of emerging coronamid pupa, few of the trout's food sources, or other fish for that matter, um, move uh, vertically or hang vertically. They hang horizontally. So the whole balance fly philosophy is using a, uh, a, a, a either a pin cut to length, or now I get sequin pins at Michael's. This fly has really evolved a lot in how it's tied um, over, you know, since this uh, fly is done, I do it even a little more differently now um, and then you put a tungsten bead on the end of that pin and what that does is it counterbalances the um, the bend area of the hook that heavy uh, the, the heaviest part of the hook and, and causes the fly to tip horizontally now when Jerry first tied these I, he used uh, standard down eye hooks and my introduced my introduction to the balance fly equation was these small jig hooks uh, nowadays, I'm using the Daiichi 4640. It's a really stout jig hook. It's a 60 degree jig hook. The mm. whole purpose of the jig hook is so when you finish the fly, the hook eye is still exposed and you have a fly you can tie on. Right? A lot of you, if you're not careful with a standard down eye hook, you can uh, obscure the hook eye in the tying process. I always joke, those are the ones you give away to your friends. <laughs> Say they never give you any flies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's what the jig hook's all about. And the fly then rides horizontally and hook point up. So these are fl these flies are, are most commonly used under an indicator, but they are deadly effective cast and retrieve because they're a little jig. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I balance everything practically nowadays. You do? Well, balance pheasant tails, balance scuds, balance damsels, huh. balance minnow patterns, and, of course, balance leeches. and do lots of different colors, but this bruise coloration by far is my favorite. Uh, the black blue Arizona semi seal is just, it has a real hex on fish. They love it. This flies work for me all over North America. Yeah. Is this still the way you tie it? How you're, you're, we're seeing here uh, with basically, I don't, you know, I don't take common household pins that I cut to length anymore. Yeah. I, Actually, you can buy a type of pin called a sequin pin, S-E-Q-U-I-N, uh -huh. and I get those from Michaels in the stitchery section. They come in gold and in um, silver. And if you look on my YouTube channel on other uh, videos tied after this one, uh, you'll see that I use those, and they're just cut to length. So there's no cutting. The, uh, the, the drawback sometimes with cutting pins to length is you can leave a ragged end where you've cut the majority of it off, and that can be a bit of a, you know, a, a danger of the tying thread. Hmm. 
Hmm. Fred has suicidal tendencies, as you mm-hmm. know. Jump into scissors and hook points and all kinds of things to break. <laughs> but this is uh, still a method, tried and true. It still works today. Yep. Uh, I don't usually, nowadays, I usually don't push the bead up onto the, uh, the back of the pin with the thread. I sort of uh, let the, when I'm constructing the body, that will naturally happen anyway. But it just sort of illustrates when I go through the balancing process how that fly hangs. Mm-hmm. Right? If and anything, you're... you want it to hang a little nose down if you're going to pre-balance, uh, to be honest, I, I rarely do this step anymore because I've tied so many of these things. I just know that if you get your pin roughly, uh, sorry, your your bead, so you could, when it's on the pin, right, it pushed yep. against the end, you could get envision two more beads getting on that pin extension, and you're about right. Oh, right. Yeah. Gotcha. That helps whether you're using, you know, on, on size 10 hooks, I'm using a one eighth tungsten on 12s, 14s, 7 64s. And on bigger flies, what's the next size up? Is it 5 16ths? I can't remember my fractions. Yeah, yeah. Um, but after that, that's a pretty heavy fly to throw on the slender leaders. We like to use indicator fishing. It uh, becomes an ends justify the means presentation. But boy, these flies are deadly effective. Gotcha. And and how do you, and again, fishing this, uh, there's a number of different ways you can fish it under indicator or? Yeah, that's the most common way uh, to hang it under the indicator a foot or two off the bottom. Um, and also, um, particularly in the fall months, I do this a lot when trout are in really shallow water is, is just to fish this with a floating line and maybe a, a 12 foot, uh, tapered leader, maybe add some tippet to take it out to 14, maybe depends on the depth and just cast and strip it using about a four to six inch strip pause retrieve. And that really gets that fly rising and falling through the water. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh trout, they really like that. And the, the beauty of this fly when you're fishing without an indicator, it lands on its nose. So it's quite weedless. Um, you can walk it over a rocky bottom and it won't hang up. Hmm. So I've had lots of people that fish smallmouth bass. And, uh, it's a great looking little, can make some great looking grayfish patterns. Um, I also tie it for minnow pattern variations. It's, it's become almost a tying style, although I do definitely use balanced leeches an awful lot in a variety of colors. Mm-hmm. Nice. And uh, so with the materials, again, maybe you could run through the, what you're using here for all the sure. materials. Yeah, on this particular one, I'm using a tuft of rabbit fur for the tail, black rabbit in this case, but you could certainly use marabou or fox. Um, you know, I probably use marabou most often, but, uh, you know, a little tuft of rabbit fur is uh, uh, arguably um, more readily available and some good quality marabou. I don't know about you, Dave, but finding marabou sometimes is good. I like a marabou that's quite, with lots of fibers on the individual uh, plumes and uh, mm-hmm. so it gives uh, you don't need a lot but it still gives the illusion of some bulk and i'll tie that marabou in and add a, a little accent of um, probably my favorite is the uv pearl or ice blue pearl flashaboo hmm. uh, a couple of strands uh, tied along each side of the tail okay just a, yeah just a couple of strands yeah not too much yep. uh, don't want to overdo it uh, just a little accent I'll, i call it Yep. So I typically tie them along the near side and then fold the two strands that are protruding forward of the initial tying point back along the far side. I like my tail sandwiched between the flashaboo. Um, I, I don't know whether it actually works any better, but it makes me feel good. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then the rest of the body is, uh, is just uh, the Arizona Simi Seal spun in a dubbing loop and i'm a big fan of dubbing loops mm-hmm. uh, for my team because they're very durable uh and they really give a buggy brushed out you know real buggy um look lots of translucence so i tend to form, I form the dubbing loops usually at the midpoint of the hook just forward of the hook point so i don't accidentally break i form about a four inch loop a nice manageable loop around my forefinger load that loop up with the dubbing twist it tight and then once I've twisted it tight, I now take a, uh, you know, a Velcro dubbing brush, or I've got a, one of the hairline dubbing brushes, uh, and I just give it a, an aggressive brush out just to free up some of those long uh, mohair strands and free up as much of the dubbing as I can, and then wind it forward um, almost like a wet hackle, uh, a soft hackle, where you just, after each wrap, you're sweeping the fibers back um, so you don't trap them down and wind them all the way to the, to the front. Right. 
Okay. Nice. So you're going to, um, yeah. And you're going to use the dubbing loop for most of the rest of this fly. Yeah. All the way forward, you know, and you could blend colors or put half one color, half another color. You know, there's lots of, you could take any of your favorite leech style, minnow style flies and, and give it a balanced makeover. Um, with the dubbing, um, you, you know, it's quite wiry. So a trick we used to, we do borrowed over from when we used, um, seals fur was to take once the fly is done or the flies are done um you know once i've whip finished them i'll give them a, another brush out to free up more fibers and then we'll go get a glass of hot water you can either put it in a microwave or boil it with a kettle probably most of us use microwaves nowadays and at or near boiling and take a pair of hemostats because you don't want to burn your fingers and just dip that fly into that hot water and that will train and style those fibers to flow back and really nice slender leech like profile to them and, and that's the kind of thing you do again after you've tied a bunch of them it's kind of a final step and then just set them aside to dry so a, a good trick there for any time you're tying with mohair based patterns just to turn those fibers the hot water hmm. don't leave them there too long it can start releasing some of the dye out of the materials sure huh yeah. nice and and then the bruised and then what is the bruise part of it the bruised is black and blue. Yeah. That's the color of the dubbing. So, so that's it. It's just all, so pretty much just the black and blue is going to, and then what other colors are you going to typically use? I mean, there's a bunch of different, but. Yeah, I've got one I tie with an orange bead called CBO. That's using Canadian black and orange. I always joke. I'm not sure what Canadian black is. It's like Canadian <laughs> bacon. Our bacon's the same as anybody else. <laughs> Canadian bacon, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, I do a couple in the pumpkin series that have brown uh, tails and bodies and or olive tail and body with a uh, uh, hot orange ice dub um, hot spot on the front of it uh, just as a trigger point uh, all black kind of a peacock black coloration um, oh, what else other colors uh, claret burgundy maroon whatever yeah. you want to call it is yeah. another one there's just a host of different colors and that's just in the leech range yeah does it depend on the vegetation uh, for the color when you're fishing or is it that's always a good way for any uh to fig to figure out what the potential colors are but you still can't beat turning over rocks and logs and, and catching yeah. the actual one because uh a lot of times dark colors are predominant in leeches you know blackish colors olives those kind of things so yep. it always pays to catch catch an after i think the good thing about leech patterns in general is trout just look at that and go that's food i don't care what yeah. color it is and eat it with a with a gut with gusto exactly and then there's no other weight so just that tungsten bead is pretty much enough no, that's enough uh yeah, yeah. because you remember you've balanced the fly so if you right. start screwing around with uh, more weight you'll tip it forward and where you really have to be careful is the length of your tail you don't want to make them too long because you're just attaching a weight to the back end of the fly and you'll tip the fly a little out oh yeah back. now it doesn't have to be perfect because water tends to support the fly a little more uh, than air, so it'll it'll more or less horizontal is fine. It'll it'll be accepted by the fish. Okay, cool. We'll let you want to move on to the next one or anything else to yeah. talk about. Yeah. No, just use this fly for. It's not just a trout fly. I've caught some very nice large mouth and small mouth bass on balanced flies yep. and balanced minnow stuff. Take this. What's in this this tying particular tying video and just apply it to your favorite um you know subsurface fly if it'll have, um yep if a balanced philosophy will help it i encourage you to try it and use it okay and picking it out any tips when you're picking it out or how, how bushy are you trying to get it and just to cover I, the again the benefits of a dubbing loop i'm pretty aggressive i'll basically give it a good hard brush on all four sides mm -hmm. and really try to stroke the fibers backwards to train them so here i'm using a a old, you know, I was using an old toothbrush with Velcro stuck on it. Yep. So lots of different dubbing teasers out there, but aggressively brush it out to free up as many of those fibers as you can. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, uh, yeah, let's move over to the pearly damsel. Yes. This is, uh, this is going to be a good one here. So yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about before we get into it, what this one's all about? Sure. It just imitates a, uh, damselfly nymph. It's, uh, um, Along with my grizzly damsel, another pattern on my channel, this is my favorite uh, damsel pattern. Dead simple. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's it's um, 
It's made out of one single plume of marabou. Hmm. Just using the marabou in different ways. So the beauty of it is, A, it's one one plume. Um, B, it's there's no issues of color match issues. If you try and match dubbing to marabou or vice versa, where dye lots can be a little different and the fly looks different, this uh, this fly will look all the same. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and on the damsels, there's also different colors and lots of yes. different, yeah. Yeah, damsels can really vary in colors. You know, um, Brian and I were talking about it uh, a few weeks ago, how the colors you've seen in, in you could take a net sample out of uh, a clump of weeds and get four, five, six different colors of damsel fly nymphs because they're <laughs> really, they're predators, they're masters of camouflage, so they can hunt their prey. And we've seen them from a, a pale, really tough to match watery olive to almost a maroonish brown coloration in the same sample. But generally, they're going to match um, the vegetation. So in clearer waters where your vegetation tends to be lighter, you're going to be see some of your lighter olives, your bright greens. And when you get into your dark, muddy bottom algae type lakes, um, you're going to see dark olives, brown olives, uh, browns almost as well. But again, you just can't beat catching a few for yourself. So. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. So you're starting off and, and the UV, is that, um, something you tend to use a lot? Um, some of the UV materials, the UV fluorescence, anything that fluoresces UV, I, I kind of like the reflectance part. The science seems to be changing all the time. And I think the last, um, I had seen that, uh, trout really can't see any UV reflectiveness. They use, lose that ability. Uh, once their uh, eyes start to adjust when they, get to a catchable size but that that reflect that reflectance that fluorescence if you like that um uh, some materials give so you can always hit the materials with a little bit of a uv light and see if they fluoresce back at you okay okay it might, it's a bit of a standout in the crowd right yeah i think throwing your advantage Okay, so so starting out with this damsel, you just want to grab. Uh, so you said, is there a key of like, like how much or which part of the? Uh... Oh, I'm going to use the whole feather. So yeah. The tail is is a is a part of that plume that you strip off the side and measure on all of my. Whenever I'm using marabou, I rarely pinch it to length. I really like to measure even up the tails by standing those fibers perpendicular to the stem, get those tips to even up and then tie those in and I want probably a tail that's at least the shank length long. I'm just tying this on a standard um, standard shank hook, not a long shank. Mm-hmm. The tail doesn't necessarily imitate the three paddle-like tails of the damsel, but the whole abdomen that sways back and forth, it uses that whole abdomen to propel itself through the water. So this a long tail will help suggest that for you. Okay. And by okay. stripping them and measuring to length, I get the natural taper of the materials in, and I just think it moves better in the mm-hmm. water. Okay. Any other uh, little tips on tying this one? Uh, well, you, you're you going to um, tie in the tail uh, like you would a leech pattern or something. Just keep it sparse. And then the body itself is the marabou is then dubbed marabou fibers probably next to a rabbit are one of the most easiest materials to dub. So hmm. I just take a, uh, um, a, uh, a couple of, of marabou um, plume, uh, not plumes, uh, fibers, and just twist them around the tying thread like dubbing. Huh. I use that to dub the body. And then for the legs, I use, um, I'll take the tip section of the marabou and remove the very tip section and you may have heard of that DeFeo style of uh, hackling used on Atlantic salmon flies, where you keep the fibers on the stem and then um, use that to control the materials. But the legs of this fly are just the marabou fibers as well. So the entire fly is made up of the single plume, just using different parts of that plume. Gotcha. In different ways. Okay. Uh, to form the tail, the body, the legs, and then dub in and around the head. Okay, and then and you get a little bit of flash on this one as well. Yeah, a little Mirage Opal Mylar. Love that stuff. <laughs> Do you pretty much put flash on most all your flies, would you say? Or, um, 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 a little bit. If, yeah. I'm, if, if this fly is to be used in more stained water, I might choose a fly with a little bit more flash. If it's really clear water conditions, the flash will be very subtle. I don't want – sometimes I think they can get – 
just can get put off by something that looks like a Las Vegas street sign going by. So yep. I'll, I'll be a little bit more somber. So it's it's conceivable I could uh, um, tie this fly in, in a couple of different ways. And um, Actually, I think I made a mistake. I think I said I dubbed the body on this. I actually tie the marabou. So I tied in a clump of the tail, and then I strip off another clump and tie it in by the tips and then wind it forward. I oh, twist yeah. it wind it forward. Huh. How do you think that's different from skinny. dubbing? Yeah, uh, it gives a nice skinny um, body, and when you twist it, um, as you wind it forward, it really makes those fibers radiate out. Oh, and yeah. Sticking out and, and, again, just adding some life to the fly. Yeah, that's cool. But the challenge with damselfly nymphs is that snake-like sinusoidal swimming motion they have um, can be very touch, tough to match in uh, selective conditions. So I think any kind of movement you can add into your fly while still maintaining that um, real skinny damselfly nymph profile works to your advantage. Uh -huh. The slims right down once it gets wet as you Oh, know. yeah. Yep. Okay, and then you're going to do a little bit of a rib here with some copper wire? or yep. the, Yeah. Yeah, use the copper wire uh, to hold down that uh, mylar shellback on top. Gotcha. Okay, and then what are the, uh, we're going to get into this a little bit, but the, the eyes on it? The eyes are just, um, you could certainly melt your own. That was commonplace for years, but um, you can use, uh, you know, plastic monofilament eyes um, that you, you can get nowadays. You can even use ultra small bead chain eyes if you wanted to as well. There's some really small ones out there if you want to add a little bit of weight. But most of the time I fish this fly up near the, in the shallows where they like to hunt, and I let the fly line drag it down. So, um, hmm. you know, a floating line with a longer leader, maybe 15 foot, 12, 15 feet. A midge tip line is another good one, or a hover or clear intermediate. Okay. And are there, I think we had a question, uh, well, we did have a question on, on casting, you know, when you're using these long leaders and you add some wind and stuff like that. Do you have any tips on casting these setups? Yeah, definitely. Um, I always say if you can cast a 9-footer, you can cast a 15 or 20-footer. Just the margin of error is a little <laughs> a little less forgiving. Um, but you obviously I anchor with the wind at my back, use the wind to my advantage, use weight forward lines, um, and just like any good casting, smooth application of power, uh, crisp rod stop. You can open up your loop by breaking the wrist slightly. So open up that loop a little bit. You might lose a little distance, mm. but you you won't you know there won't risk the risk of that leader dropping as much. And minimum false cast that probably makes sense. Yep. So with today's modern weight forward lines, you can once, twice, and then let her go. And I like to always have a remember that a weight forward line is designed to shoot to the target. Yeah. So don't excessively false cast. Get that head section moving. Have that reserve of running line at your feet or on your stripping apron, and then just hold that when you go to shoot the rod, hold that high rod position at the stop and let that totally shoot out. Hmm. And it'll actually hit the end of the reel sometimes, or you can pinch it off just at the end, and that will slingshot, meaning it'll that will make that line come to an abrupt stop, and that'll turn everything over, and it should land nice and delicate for you. Okay, cool. And you were saying in, in the key? Okay. And you want to get with the wind at your back. That's another key position, yeah. Yeah, usually in still waters, we want to put the wind at our back uh, just for, uh, you know, self-preservation. Yeah. Um, but, out, you know, in lakes, in their DNA, they're river creatures, you browns, rainbows, etc., and they uh, will instinctively nose into the wind. Mm -hmm. hmm. Any kind of current, they're going to try and find it. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be traveling upwind, and you're casting down into their – you know, they're cruising line. Okay. Nice. Okay. Well, this looks like we got a couple more steps here. Um, so finishing up the last part with the eyes, yeah. uh, this is the final little section. Any, any special tips on doing this? That's just the dubbing technique I talked about. There, once the eyes are in, uh, then you take a couple of fibers from that marabou plume we've been using throughout this fly, twist it around the tying thread, and just figure eight, weave it in and around the eyes to cover up any thread and just to give that head the definition. The key thing with a damselfly nymph and, um, you know, the darner nymphs, their larger dragonfly cousins, is the head is the widest part. So hmm. try to keep your body portions within that um, dimension and you'll be fine. You don't want to 
a squat, heavy, obese damsel. You want nice and skinny, just like the naturals. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, do we want to move on to the sure. uh, next one? All right, the next one has got a great name here, the uh, Tequila Booby. <laughs> yes. This is, this is uh, I, I got to hear the uh, the story here on this one. Is there? <laughs> Actually, no, the name has been, I think it's, the coloration is similar to the steelhead fly, the tequila sunrise. It has nothing to do with oh, okay. with the uh, that liquid that spoils a lot of parties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, attractor patterns have really taken hold in recent years here in North America. Uh, very popular in the competition scene, but very commonplace in Europe. And the booby is a um, sort of a must-have. Well, these attractor flies the booby, um, other attractors we now fish, and they're on my YouTube channel, the blob, uh, the watsit, or huh. jelly mop, I call it. It's got a mop tail on it. you know. And um, there's one called a fab, which stands for Fomar's blob. But this is a, um, a fly that, you know, obviously you look at that color scheme, and uh, nothing in nature looks like that. No. I think sometimes trout see that and say, nor should there be and really try to kill it. So this is a fly we primarily use to trigger a bite. You know, you're in a situation where you've tried all the match, match the hatch permutations. It's not gone according to plan. So now you're going to trigger a bite. You're going to, you know, you fish these aggressively. We fish them um, fast, you know, four to six inch strips with pauses. We fish them with fast sinking lines, uh, type five, six, seven, um, to drag them down, although you certainly can and should try using boobies on the surface. I have caught smallmouth bass stripping and you know, aggressively hand twisting a booby across the surface hmm. and had small fish come up and crush them. Wow. Because they create a wake. Oh, yeah. So, and we also use these flies when, when trout are targeting zooplankton or daphnia, um, which is a bit frustrating because the trout basically filter feed these, particularly when they get into deep water. Uh, in the summer months or in the summer as it transitions into fall. Um, zooplankton are often found in deeper water because they feed on phytoplankton, which is even smaller. Hmm. And uh, phytoplankton is light sensitive, so it tends to only come up to the surface um, at night. So when the sunlight's on, um, then the uh, it retreats to the shallow water, the deeper water rather. The zooplankton follows, and of course all the predators, the whole circle of life thing, um, follows them around as well. Hmm. So, so okay. a tequila in this stage is basically a booby with a yellow back end and an orange front end. And in this case, I'm using yellow marabou, yellow fluorescent fluorescent yellow marabou. You could also use um, the Fritz body material we're going to use on this fly um, to form a yellow butt on it too. So you'll see tequila boobies tied in a number of different variations, but the it's the color scheme that generally defines it as a tequila booby. Uh, yellow back end, uh, bright uh, orange front end. Okay, okay. Yeah. Cool, and then the uh, and then the, the booby part is just kind of, what's that all about? Well, that's the foam eyeballs that are used on the fly. So I'll let you, ex when, you when you see the finished fly and those two big foam eyeballs, yeah. I'll let you figure out where the booby part comes Yeah, from. yeah. And, and is it, when you're fishing it, what, what's the idea there? With, well, with those. It, it provides buoyancy, so it's this fly is not a dry fly, as I said. It's most commonly fished aggressively on fast sinking lines, where the line is used to drag this fly down, <laughs> and then when you're stripping it, those eyes will they'll cause the fly to wobble. They'll rise and fall on the paws. The whole thing, oh, yeah. is, thing, it's shaking and baking. It's just gotcha. The, the pace of the retrieve and the sort of wobbly nature of the fly and the color combinations, um, that's all worked together to in some way trigger a grab. Okay, makes sense. Okay, and now you're adding some a uh, little bit of uh, orange. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Fritz. And nowadays, there's, uh, it's hard to keep up with some of these changes because now we have the regular Fritz, which is, which is a chenille-like material but it doesn't have the pearl in it's a lot softer and you can really compress it on there and i think since starting to tie this fly one of the best ways to tie this material in is damp so nowadays when i tie this fly in evolution is i'll take the length of material i'm going to use 
and I will put it in a little glass or a little plate of water and let it get saturated. And it's so much easier to manage huh. when it's because you can sweep those fibers back because you really want to pack this. Oh, yeah. Uh, but this is regular fl fritz. The fibers are, I believe, 15 millimeters across its width. There is now jelly fritz. There is daphnia fritz. There's slush jelly. Um, there's just tons of different huh. materials out there. And, of course, you could tie this with regular chenilles, a regular yeah. body. You could take that bruised leech I tied and turn it into a booby. Okay. Um, and what about like a like a cactus chenille? Is that stuff still? Yeah, you, could use, you could use that too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The fritz is the, the common material. And if you can get a hold of this stuff, and it's becoming more and more readily available uh, in Canada, I, I get mine um, – through um excuse my phone oh yeah no, no worries i get mine um through uh, a company called canadian llama and they get a lot of this uh, these english based materials uh from there as well okay so yeah. Yeah. never fails the phone would ring oh yeah oh yeah now we got the uh, the, the the booby round eyes the round eyes now you can buy these pre uh pre-done uh, as I've used here, but you can also buy what uh, is often referred to as booby cord or booby foam, and it's just a round. It looks like giant parachute post material, but it's a little denser, uh -huh. and you cut them. In this case, I'm using a scud hook, and it's important to always use short-shanked hooks with these flies, anything with foam flies, and I'll come back to that in a second. You can either, again, you can see that they're pre-made, or you can cut them about the, the <clears> length of the hook shank and then take a pair of round scissors <clears throat> on the ends and you can see here i just take the uh the uh and you do this whether you trim them yourselves or buy them pre-done is wrap that uh thread around the uh the booby eyes prior to tying and then just by winding the thread they'll walk right up and right on top it's a lot easier to do it that way i find than trying to hold them in place and figure eight them down so i mentioned the short shanked hooks what you've got to be careful of with foam-based flies is there can be a tendency at times for trout to take them quite deeply. <clears throat> and what happens is, and what I believe happens, is whenever you pause a regular fly that's unweighted but still has the mass of the hook or a weighted fly, when you pause that fly for a prolonged period of time, it will sink. It will fall down on a tight leader. And so, so if a fish swims up and grabs it, there's a good chance you're going to feel that immediately. But with buoyant flies, when you pause it, they rise upward on slack leader, and the fish feels no resistance to the fly and then subsequently swallows it. So you always want to use fast-paced retrieves. That's when this fly works better, so you're always mm -hmm. in contact with the fly. Makes sense. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's pretty darn effective. That's going to sl slim right down. But uh, that's the booby, and again, check my channel out for other ones, the fab, the jelly, yep. the jelly fab, or, or the jelly, um, <coughs> the jelly mop fly, or the watsit, and it's called a watsit because the mop tail makes it look like a watsit uh, potato chip or crisp, which is popular in England, and then with no uh, buoyancy in it at all, it's called the blob. All right, I want to move, uh, move on to the foam minnow? Certainly. All right. So what do we want to, anything you want to uh, talk about on this one? Yeah, this one came about, um, you know, some of the lakes I fish uh, in uh, Western Canada on the prairie lakes have a good, healthy population of small minnows, fathead minnows and brook stickleback. The fathead's a pretty widespread minnow across North America. And these minnows are creatures of the shallows. Um, they're not, they don't school up like, uh, you know, shad or something like that. They like to stay in and around the vegetation. So the trout go in there and herd them up, big brown trout and rainbows. And that's pretty exciting if you ever get to see it. Hmm. It's just like watching, you know, saltwater fish chasing minnows around and slashing through them. Very exciting stuff. And unfortunately, one of the challenges of that is it's very shallow water, lots of weeds, sunken debris, especially if you're fishing around beaver lodges. It's nice to have a pot pattern that's sort of somewhat buoyant or neutrally buoyant, so you can cast it into these tight um, sort of structure-prone areas and, and still keep your flies and not get them hung up. Huh. So this fly uses a foam underbody 
underneath the mylar um, to hold it up. Okay. So you can use any long shank hook, whatever uh, minnow size you're trying to approximate uh, and look. And then you build the foam underbody by foam by folding a by I actually stab a uh, a length of foam that's roughly about the gape of the hook wide, uh, maybe a little under. Okay. Sort of stab that onto the bare hook, and then fold it and glue it around um, the hook shank itself. And we're just providing a, a, an underbody for this fly, so it'll be buoyant. Okay. And what is the typically the glue? Just any special type. Uh, just super glue. Yeah, super glue. Uh, yeah. Probably you can use the brushable type, but sometimes I find the sort of the gel type that's a little uh, thicker, doesn't flow all over the place, stays a little bit more in control, so you don't glue yourself to your fly. Okay. Uh, and just put a little bead of that down, and then fold that around that glued hook, and just pinch it for a few seconds, and it'll 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 take hold. Okay. You, you want to keep the hook eye area fairly exposed. Don't get tight up against it um, because you've got to tie in some material at the front. You just need working space to do that. So you can see I, I've pinched this around, and after a couple of pinches, it'll set up pretty quick. And then I just cut it to, to shape. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then as far as fishing this similarly, are you going to fish this different than some of the other ones we talked about? Um, no, it's similar a lot of times. You know, usually it's the conditions I'm faced with as far as – uh, water depth and, and retrieve speed and those kind of things and the food source I'm trying to imitate that'll dictate the line that's best suited for that challenge so but as these are mostly in the shallows uh, floating lines midge tips and slow sinking lines like the Hubbard that sinks at about an inch per second are probably my top three for this okay yeah. and but, do you have we're kind of in the fall right now yeah. do you have any patterns that are I mean are these patterns you you would be you would use uh, this time of year do you have some other ones that we, were, we haven't seen yet that you might use this time of year uh in the fall um this would be certainly one of them uh, most of your hatches um have three ball are done so trout are feeding on those bread and butter food items such as uh, minnows that are around you know things that i call them staples these are food sources that are in the water year round or um, have fully aquatic life cycles. So uh, minnows, leeches, uh, freshwater shrimp or scuds, um, immature coron you know, coronamid larvae are a good um, bloodworm, are good to use as well. Uh, dam smaller damselfly and dragonflies, they have, particularly dragonflies, have a multi-year life cycle in the aquatic form. So they're around all the time, kind of like a stonefly in rivers and streams. So you're just going to fish smaller sizes. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that's sort of my, and then attractor patterns as well, <laughs> like the yep. booby, uh, for those days where, you know, you want to catch a fish and it's not happening, so you're trying to induce it. So. Okay, and, and now you're uh, you're measuring out, um, I guess this is going to be part of the body, the, the mylar. Yeah, the mylar, I just push over top of it, and you can do this a couple of ways. In this video, I, I kind of fold it over. Um, but you can certainly just push it over. Some people, that's how they tie their zonkers in, is push it over and tie it down fore and aft. But I kind of like the look that um, tying it in at the front of the fly and then sort of folding it back over itself, uh, flipping it inside out, um, helps give that rounded head of a natural minnow. Hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, I see what you're doing. Yeah, you're going to fold it, right, and wrap it over. Yeah, so you just don't want to make a... You know, I measure. You make sure you measure the mylar, um, so it's just about the length of the shank. You don't want to go too long because it, then it won't fold as nicely around the back end of the fly because the the hook tends to get in the way a little bit. So just just about the slightly longer than the hook shank. Get that bound down in front, and then um, you know the fly at this point is going to be finished at the back end. Okay, cool. Yeah. So. So we're getting close to the end of the hour here. I'm, maybe we'll watch this one wrap up here, and then we'll take uh, maybe uh, take a few questions uh, once we hit the uh, end of the hour here. And then, so now you've got now. What is this you're using? This is a little um, the hackle here, or well, that's just for a little tuft of tail. So you could use, um, you know, this is grizzly because a mottled tail many minnows have. So. Uh, you know, like the base of a schlappen feather has some beautiful, the base of a grizzly nose. Oh, right. I'm using the stuff most people throw away. Yeah. Yeah, you want that fluffy. 
I mean, I guess most of these, do you see most of these uh, patterns, a lot of these have, you like that fluffy stuff as opposed to kind of the stiffer. Yeah, because we're in a, in a still water environment. We don't have current like in a river to help animate our flies. We've got to have some built-in animation. We either get our flies to animate by the materials we use or pulling how we move them through the water um, to get them to move. So probably with the exception of the smaller stuff like coronamid larva and pupa, anytime we can add a little bit of motion to our flies is going to help suggest life and, and convince that fish that our fraud is actually something they'd want to eat yeah yeah that's a slick move there pulling that thing over the top the mylar yeah and you notice i kept the pole <coughs> over on the uh upward on the uh, flush along the bottom so i don't impede the hook gate but also keep the buoyancy at the top and that'll help keep the fly um riding pot um you know hook point down all right uh-huh nice it's a little tricky sometimes, just you know, not too tricky, but just folding that. Um, yeah, because it can it can splay out on you, right? And that's and this becomes a matter of personal preference. I, I tend to trim as many of those little fibers away as I can. Other tires like that little bit of flash in the tail, and we'll just leave them. So again, it's some fun of fly time. You can put your own personality onto anything. Gotcha. Cool. Awesome. Now, now, what do we have left for steps on this one? Uh, just to uh, whip finish um, and at the base of the tail and uh, uh, put some eyeballs on it and give it uh, some makeup. <laughs> yeah. Take some markers and uh, color it up to match whatever uh, um, bait fish you're trying to imitate. Okay. Well, do we want to watch this finish up or do you want to move on to the uh, – I think we got one more here. No, we can move on. <coughs> on as long as uh, again these are all on the channel so people yeah. can watch great great uh, depth there and yep they've and if got they... specific questions they can answer ask questions through the comments section and, and on youtube where are you you're at uh, just uh what was your channel uh <laughs> <laughs> just look up phil roley yeah exactly you'll call yeah phil roley yeah as it yeah um so yeah let's move on to this uh so now you got to pronounce this mikulik mikulik sedge oh, mikulik mikulik after the originator Art Mikuluk, who was uh, lived in Calgary, and this is a caddis pattern uh, intended to um, uh, suggest the large traveler sedges that the lakes of Western North America are kind oh, of cool. famous for, like size sixes and eights. This oh, is wow. kind of the golden stone Terranarsis of uh, of bugs. So um, no kidding, a, a lot of fun to fish because you get big explosive rises. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, so this is just a fly that's tied using clumps of elk hair, um, tied along the, you know, an elk hair tail. At uh, just above the hook point, you tie in a clump of elk hair at the midpoint. Oh yeah. Three quarters point, and the the elk has a cumulative effect. If I can offer one piece of advice on this fly, is don't overdo your elk hair. Like keep your clumps sparse because they yeah. build yeah. up. If you try to use too much elk hair per clump, it gets very hard to bind it securely to the shank, and it'll start to twist and, and roll on, and you won't get a, a very <clears> strong. Okay. Yeah. It's a little time-consuming, but it's actually quite simple. Yeah. And, and you, is it typically, is that dyed elk hair? Uh, no, I, it's actually, in this case, I think it was bleached um, because mm. I like it to, uh, to stand up. Uh, to be seen because a lot of times we're fishing these flies the, be the best emergences are right at dusk for these big travelers so it's just the you know probably deer hair better approximates the natural color but it's hard to see in low light conditions gotcha and then now fishing this one can you do a little summary of how you're going to fish this uh yeah it's all floating line um we either cast out uh if you're targeting rising fish obviously try to cover the rise um, but if fish are around slashing at the adults and the takes to these are aggressive, uh, then you let it sit. And if nothing happens, you can, the beauty of this fly, the way we finish it off with the hackle and sort of that elk hair caddis type uh, front to it, it'll skate and create a wake. And these caddis, once they uh, emerge, they start running around on the surface like little speed boats. Uh, in fact, in some circles, I think they call it the motorboat caddis. Huh. And they create quite a wake. And the trout can be really attracted to that. Um, one of the cool things you'll see sometimes when you fish these is, uh, on occasion, trout will try and drown the fly. Wow. They'll come up and swamp it, which huh. is 
when you first see it, you immediately set, right? And you've got this fish slashing around trying to find his lunch. Um, and if you see that and know that for a while, you'll see the, uh, the slide. Just leave your fly there because within a few seconds, he'll turn around and come back and take wow. it. So it's, it's a bit nerve-wracking. Crazy. But, uh, it's a so, lot of fun. So what is the swamping? Is that like what are the fish doing? They're actually... I think they're trying to drown it. It's a big bug, and it can fly away, and they sort of learned if they swamp it and half drown it, it can't fly anymore, and then it's just easier to eat. Yeah. Because, because the take when it comes back is not necessarily the vicious uh, explosion you see with a stripped caddis. They just sort of come up, poke their head out, and eat it, right, and sort of deliberate. It's almost like they know they've kind of crippled the caddis, and, and now they can be a little more uh, gotcha. eating. So, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, it's a cool fly. It's uh, huh. it's exciting. Uh, it's like exciting fishing. This was uh, a pattern I featured in my first book, Fly Patterns for Still Waters. And uh, the originator, Art Mikuluk, who's since passed on, he sent me some of his originals. And he spent, uh, if you read the piece on there about this fly, he spent a lot of time finding just the right material. And it was elk hair that he, huh. I believe, um, tanned up himself using uh, rock salt or borax and left in the trunk of his car. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't recommend that now. There's lots of good uh, uh, materials out there that you can tan. But uh, yeah. the importance is to keep this uh, material sparse. It builds up on itself. So don't try and pile too much elk hair on there. Yeah, yeah, because you just put a base of elk hair. Now you're going to go through and halfway through you're going to add some more elk hair. Yep, I'm yep. going to dump a little bit, and, and it's this is a fly you can get out of whack with proportions and run out of room. So my first, I'll dub a little bit, and I'll dub just forward of the hook point. Then that's where I'll tie in the set, the first clump. It's just a micro, a two or three thread wraps, if that, in front of the hook point. And then I'll dub to the midpoint, and then I'll tie in another clump, and then I will dub to about the three-quarters mark. And that's where I put the last clump in that forms the, the front head area of the fly. Okay. Okay. Nice. And um, I'm just kind of looking at some other questions that uh, came in. Um, so I guess we had, I mean, some one of the questions, what are some good patterns that imitate bait fish? I guess we've kind of looked at uh, one, but do you have some other? Oh, yeah. Um, if you, I just released a, 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 fish, a fish, a fly on my YouTube channel tonight called the uh, Balanced Ice Minnow. Dead simple, black tail, silver body. Yep. That silver bead, really simple. Okay. That is a deadly pattern for us in the fall months in particular. But uh, I tell you, on my, web, on my YouTube channel, you'll see the Marabou Thunder Creek is on there. Uh, small zonker patterns work well. All right. Um, I tie balance minnows. I'll be releasing one of those uh, shortly too with eyeballs and stuff on it like that. Um, um, those work. And simple uh, West Coast patterns. Um, there was a mylar, um, tied down minnow that basically had a really sparse mylar body and a mallard flank wing dyed nat either natural or dyed olive or brown. Oh, yeah. We imitate uh, salmon fry, you know, chum fry, huh. coho fry. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and they all had different colorations and very skinny and slender, and that's also worked well for me as well. A good old pheasant tail, flashback pheasant tail, can be a great little um, immature um, bait fish. Huh, no but, kidding. But or not, it's got that dark coloration uh, that are common to many of the, the uh, shallow water minnow species. Yep. Wow. Yeah, the pheasant tail, that thing is all around a great one. Okay, let's see. I got... Um, some more here. Let's see. We talked a little bit about the casting. We got that covered. Um, so maybe you just talk a little bit about how you target fish in still water. I mean, we've talked a little bit about that, but do you have any, like, we've looked at, I guess this is the sixth fly we've looked at. When you go in to kind of to find fish, how do you go in and target them? Do you, can you answer that question? Does that make yeah. sense? Um, you know, you always start on shore. I'm going to poke around a little bit and turn over rocks and logs. I've got a little aquarium net. I'll do some sampling. I want to see what's... Um, What's in the water? What are the most, uh, you know, what's the most prevalent food item? And, and uh, try to imitate that. But I, like a river or stream angler, I look for three things. I look for comfort, protection, and food. And I look for those features. So comfort factors are those things that get the trout the basic need, requirements it needs to live as far as oxygen. So water temperature is very uh, critical. Trout have a pretty narrow band that they're uh, active in. 
Um, so I'm looking for water temperature probably in anywhere from 50 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, um, either surface temperature or lowering a thermometer down on a string. Uh, trout are very weather sensitive. So that can put their comfort levels off a little bit. So if you've got uh, a front that's come through, that'll often drive them into deeper water. Mm. Uh, protection factors are things that are going to give the trout the, the confidence to, to throw caution to the wind, if you will. Um, they can breathe properly through the comfort factors, all that stuff. Um, so things like weed beds that provide protection, uh, a, a bit of a rippled surface through the wind will break up the sun. Oh, yeah. Um, those kind of areas, uh, adjacency to structure. So uh, they like a deep water refuge nearby. So sunken islands are favorites. As I said earlier, weed beds, drop-offs where the shallow area transitions into the deep area of the lake. And, of course, the final thing is food. That's what we mostly imitate are the food sources. So you want to go find the supermarket. Yeah. Uh, so that's, again, weed beds and shallow areas of the lake. That's where the you know, 90%, 95% of the trout's food items are going to be found. Huh. Right? In around weed beds and those kind of things. And when you have an intersection where there's good oxygen content, lots of structure for them to feel secure, and lots of food, that's like a prime lie on a river, and you're going to find you know, a lot of fish in those areas. Yeah. So and how do, you, I do that. how do you keep from getting snagged up when you're in the weed beds and all that stuff? <laughs> uh, strike indicators obviously help. Because oh, yeah. Because up off the bottom. Um, I don't... You know, most of my flies, with, with the exception of those I use under indicator systems, I don't weight them very much. I let the fly line carry them down. So when I'm using slower sinking lines, I'm going to count the fly down where I literally, either by knowing the sink rate of the line, um, I can count that fly line down. So we call it the rule of 12. So if a fly line sinks at 2 inches per second, and I divide that into the number 12, which corresponds to 12 inches and a foot, that's going to tell me that fly line is going to take six seconds to sink one foot. Therefore, I multiply that number by the number of feet I'm trying to reach, hmm. and it's put me in there. It's an approximate measure because yeah. water density always varies. But you're trying to do a controlled approach to this, so when you hook a fish, you remember what the heck you're doing, and you can do it. Right, right. Yeah. It's yep. not just chuck it out and hope for the best. No, and are you plugging that in? You get a good one, you plug it in that spot in your GPS out there, marking the location? That I have, I'm a big believer in electronics, so yeah. I do have uh, a sounder that does have GPS capabilities on it um, that I will uh, punch in from time to time. Small lakes, a lot of times, you can just sort of get a yeah. know where you are, but then bigger bodies of water, uh, GPS can be a real uh, benefit to you out there. Yep, yep. So, yeah, on this flight, you, man, you are adding that elk care. You're on, I think, what are you on now, stage four of uh, elk care? Yeah, we're coming up to the last one. Okay, the last one, yeah. Yeah, between the – there's three wings, if you will, and one tail. Okay, yeah, three wings and one tail. Wow, that's awesome. And they all work together to provide the buoyancy to help create a wake and then to give that caddis um, uh, profile. Okay. So okay. each wing is slightly shorter than the previous wing. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, that's that tent-like shape. Got the, yeah, it's a cool, that's a cool-looking fly for sure. Yeah. Yep. Well, let me, uh, let's see, another, uh, so we talked about the naked technique. Did we talk about the favorite flies for the naked? Oh, it's any, it's generally a technique we use with weighted patterns. Um, you know, it was, I first learned how to use it fishing coronamid pupa and larva, but I also fish damselfly nymphs with it this way, uh, calabatus and mayfly, calabatus mayfly nymphs, uh, scuds, uh, leeches, um, Bait fish, you can fish anything with the naked technique. Okay, anything, it's yep. A weighted technique. It's 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 a it's a method you got to practice and, and put your time in a little bit because yep. you're playing with the length of the leader, the weight of the flies, letting those flies sink, and then the retrieve speed because you've got to go super slow because if you start to go too fast, your flies will start to climb through the water. Oh. You're, still, you're still trying to use a slow enough retrieve that your flies track through. A zone in the water, just like you would with an indicator. Gotcha. Right? To depth, and you're always at that zone. Yep, yep. Yeah. That is a big. That's always a big part of it is like how fast is your retrieve? How where is it sinking? How do you know how far down your fly is? And it's a method I tend to use. I would say 15 feet of water or greater. Okay. I tend to use indicators shallower. Gotcha. Uh, and you know, so a typical cast will be a cast as far as you comfortably can with the wind at your back. You're going to let that fly sink, 
and my usual minimum sink time is 30 seconds. I use my watch. And then I bring the fly back, and I'm bringing that fly back probably half to three quarters of an inch at a time. That's how slow it goes. Wow. Right? So for a lot of people, it's agony. It's yeah. like dancing line up at Starbucks. It totally. just drives you crazy, right? So if you're a diehard streamer person who likes to rip and strip, it's yeah. an adjustment. It's an adjustment. Yeah. So you're not so you're not ripping and stripping too much out there. Not usually. Most of your prey items and all your prey the only time we rip and strip is with flies like the booby. Yeah. Uh, everything else moves slowly, right? And the trout just swim up, inhale, and move on to the next thing. Yeah. So being patient, learning patience and touch, and that's what the naked technique does, is probably two of the best skills you can learn still water fly fishing. Right. Because you learn the ability to pick up subtle takes with this method that transfers to other methods very, very well, where you're much more in tune with what your line is doing, sensations you feel and you react to them a lot quicker because a trout can inhale and spit a fly in a lake in, in a matter in a blink of an eye yep yeah. yep yeah it is the i mean do you like yeah just noticing that take i mean that must be challenging just like it is in rivers you know so a lot of those fish are touching it but maybe you're not even feeling them on do you think that's a an issue yeah it's true they can it's um i if i was to draw a parallel and it's a very awkward rough parallel it's the naked technique is similar to Euro nymphing, which I really enjoy. Oh yeah. You know, that whole tight line watching for takes, you know, um, leader construction, uh, pattern weight, all those variables that come into play in Euro nymphing come into play with this naked technique yep. too. And it's, it's once you master it, it's a blast. It's a blast. Nice. Well, you're wrapping this one up here. So yeah, we just got to do some trimming. Cool. Let's see. Let's see if we have any more questions here. Um, we talked a little bit about the. Uh, did we talk about? Uh, well, yeah, fall patterns. Um, so, do you have like best time of day in this? You know, whether it's fall, summer, or spring, is there a, is there better times of the day? Usually, the time that's most pleasant for us is most pleasant for the trout. So, in the fall months, um, you're going to be. Any in the spring, it's sort of banker's hours, gentleman's hours, whatever the term you want to use, you know, probably 9, 9.30 to 4, 4.30, maybe 5. Uh, in the summer months, it could start a little earlier, and then during the heat of the day, they might turn off. We've also got to be sensitive that they are trout, and a lot of times some of our trout lakes just get too warm, and we go chase other things. We either go river fishing or chase other more temperature-tolerant fish. Yep. Uh, but uh, generally... You don't have to, if you like to be on the water at dawn, that's great. But I generally am getting on the lake about 9, 9.30 sometimes. And that's once the water warms up a little bit, gets a little sunlight on it, that's what triggers the hatches. Yep. Perfect. And then, and then the fun begins. <laughs> <laughs> now you got this thing all trimmed up, so you're... Yep. Trim it, it flush so it'll create a wake. It rides low. If you ever see a still water caddis, it sits quite low on the water. Okay. Yep. Yep big head out of the way there but uh cool. always fun doing these tie-in videos because you're never square on i like to shoot yeah my videos at the same perspective i tie at so you get to see the same things i do but truthfully i'm off center on it and got the uh vice tilted a bit towards the, yep. the plane of the camera so sometimes i'm i'm off center to it so it's a little tricky <clears> sometimes <throat> because things you can normally see when it's straight in front of you or I got you. No, it looks good. And actually, I had that conversation with uh, I uh, on the podcast just last week. Uh, interviewed Fly Fish Food, uh, you know, and we talked a little bit about um, Curtis and Cheech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had Curtis just yeah. talk to Curtis, and he mentioned that he, you know, they do it from the opposite, where the camera's coming in from behind the fly, yeah. so it's not the first person. And and he said that they did kind of some anecdotal surveying. And basically, people are used to seeing it from the outside because so many people do it that way that it's not like that big of a deal. No, no, it's funny. Um, years ago, when I started doing tying demos at uh, some of the shows, I used to shoot over your shoulder, and it kind of stuck. Yeah, and uh, it's just the, it's just sort of the style. It, lo I, it looks I, good, I, though. It, uh, yeah, it it is a good if you can do it. It definitely works. I cool. Don't have so to I don't have to worry if I'm wearing a shirt or not. Yeah, <laughs> so that's right. Is this uh, so? Is that about it? That anything else you want to say about this one? Oh, I don't think so. No, it's a great fly. You know, you want to coat it with some floating to uh, keep it buoyant and uh, have fun because the takes to this fly are aggressive. And you can tie this fly in stone fly colors, grasshopper colors, yellows, oranges. It'd be a great river fly too. Uh, okay, perfect. Stone. 
Well, I uh-huh. think that's that's the last one we have here. Um, I'm going to head back over to the uh, the keynote here. And uh, yeah, just want to wrap this thing up. Phil, want to uh, thank you for coming on and chatting. I think that was uh, that was some good stuff in there for sure. Those are so those six flies. I think we covered six. Those are pretty much. If you had to pick six, th- those would be six you might go with. Yeah, it's a good cross representation. I definitely fish chronomids a lot. Chromi is arguably one of my, if not my favorite favorite uh, chronomid keeper pattern. I love fishing balanced flies. Uh, such a deadly pattern. So versatile. It's a tying style again. And then minnow patterns are uh, very popular in the majority of lake, uh, lakes um, as well. And then damselflies are probably built in such synonymous with lakes. Um, and a lot of fun to fish that they're out and about. All right, so I guess we'll uh, I guess we'll wrap up there, Phil, and I'll, I'll let you go. If, uh, if I have any other questions, we'll just send people to uh, Flycraft Angling. Yep, flycraftangling.com if you want to see these flies in all their glory and other flies um, on my YouTube channel. I've got well over 100 on there now, plus I'm starting to vlog a little bit now and uh-huh. then. Uh, so a little on-the-water escapades. And then I've got my Instagram channels and uh, of course the Stillwater app Stillwater uh, we have a Facebook page for the Stillwater app Stillwater um, uh, fly fishing and tying we've got a Stillwater app um, Instagram page we have a like and share contest going on right now so if you go to either of our Stillwater uh, app channels uh, and uh, like and share and uh, or mention a friend, uh, you're entered for a chance to win 24 of mine and Brian's favorite fall flies. So. Okay, okay, perfect. I just pulled up the the Chromie video again. We're rolling. It's uh, it's rolling. I love that was one I tied on my channel just because it's. Uh, I think I tied it with the rib the old, the old school way you did it with the, uh, yeah. yeah, and it was a pretty sweet looking fly. But um, all right, Phil. Well, I'll let you get going. Thanks again for coming okay. on. And uh, if anybody has questions or if I get them, I'll direct them your way. And um, I know there are a few more that came in I wasn't able to uh, get to, and I'll maybe check back with you and, and get back to those people later on. And they can contact me directly as well or to my YouTube channel or whatever however they want to communicate. I'm more than happy to talk to them. All right. Sounds good. All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, watching, and we will uh, catch you next time. Thanks again. See ya.